You're listening to Woodland Walks, a podcast from the Woodland Trust. We protect woods and plant trees for wildlife, for people. This episode is presented by Adam Shaw. Well, I'm off to Hartwood Forest. Um, It's beautiful weather today. If you don't know where that is, and I have to say I'm always getting lost, uh, to give you an idea, if you think of uh, a box with Hartwood Forest in the middle, you've got Luton just above it, Hemel Hempstead to the left, St Albans, lots of people know where St Albans is, that's just below it, and Welling Garden City to the right, and it sort of sits in the middle of all of that. So lots of people around, but it's also a very rural, beautiful place to be, I think, and I've got to find it now traffic's rather good and I'm a little bit lost but it's around here somewhere. Now I'm off to meet Becky Spate. She's the Chief Executive of the Woodland Trust. She's meeting me in the car park and also we're joined by a few volunteers who've really been central to the plantation of this forest. One is Tim Wright and Brian Legg and he's meeting us with his wife and grandchildren. So she's got to find them all. Becky, I think, is the woman sitting on her boot trying to put on some Wellington boots. Mainly what I can see is some very bright pink socks. Hold on a second. I may, of course, be going up to a completely wrong woman. Let's see, let's see. (laughs) Ah, you came prepared with good wellies. Well, the weather's, no, no, the weather's. I don't know, the sun's come out. Um, Okay, so we're at Hartwood Forest. Hartwood Woodland, Hartwood Forest, what is it called? Hartwood Forest, because it's big. It's big. Right, so first lesson for Adam, difference between a wood and a forest? Oh, no. Is is that a bad way to start? Well, it's it's tricky, actually. So forest um, actually doesn't mean lots and lots of trees. You know, it goes back to that medieval definition of an area of land where the king hunted. So it can be lots of heathland, it can be all sorts of things. Um, so even forest doesn't mean lots and lots of trees, but I always think forest big, woodland smaller. But what size that break okay. comes? Okay, but you're going to forgive me if I say the wrong word. Ah, <laughs> there's a man with a woodland trust <laughs> jacket on. Hi, nice to you. Nice to Hi I'm Adam. Adam. You're Adam, right? <laughs> and who are Brian. you? I'm Brian. Brian. <laughs> Brian. Okay, wonderful. And you're one. Of, you're you're one of the volunteers who who built this woodland. Who I helped plant it for sure? Yes. Right. Nine winters in a row. Yeah. Okay. Well, fantastic. So, okay. Yeah. Well, so you're going to guide us around here a bit? I certainly can do. And I've got my wife and two children here as well. Oh, fantastic. Oh, fantastic. How old are the kids? Uh, seven and nine. Right. And did they do a bit of planting? Uh, you asked them. Yes, they did. <laughs> they did a bit. Okay. Oh, well, Becky, I mean, I mean, Brian's one of the volunteers. Yes. But the volunteer program here yeah. it isn't just a sort of small side thing this was really crucial to what this woodland was all about yeah so so every every tree that's being planted has been planted by a volunteer now that might be a a kind of a woodland trust volunteer who's done a lot here or it might be a school child or it might be somebody from the local community but every tree was planted by somebody who wasn't you know a a professional tree planter in that sense it's it's a very large site and i was looking at the numbers the number of trees i kept having to check i've got the noughts right because It's an extraordinary... 600,000 trees planted, but then about a third of the site is, is open land as well. And there's four very important areas of ancient woodland too. And then there's a new arboretum, which Brian has been the driving force behind. There's a whole community orchard space. So it's it's got all sorts going on here. 600,000 trees, Brian. How many did you plant? <laughs> <laughs> well, several thousand. Several thousand? That's, that's super impressive. More than me. And what attracted you to being part of this? Do you live locally or what, how did you get involved? I live just four miles away from here and I retired only about a year before and I couldn't believe my luck really because I love the outdoors and this was a unique opportunity really to get involved in a new project. And, and what was this area like before? Well, apart from the four areas of ancient woodland, all the rest was arable farming. So cereals, oilseed, rape, um, those crops. And the local community, what do they think of this? 
most of them absolutely love it. Right. There's always a few exceptions, <laughs> aren't there? <laughs> okay, well, look, your kids are playing yes. with some old sticks. Shall we go join them? Okay. okay. Let's do that. So, this is one of the so we're moving away from the car park. In fact, it's interesting, quite quickly you lose sight of it. And it's a bit of open land here, so just explain to me where you're... Where are you taking me, Ryan? <laughs> well, this is one of the wildflower areas. Um, about 25% of the area is just open land, and much of that we've sown with native wildflowers. And these areas, when in a few months' time, will be a riot of colour and absolutely full of butterflies and bees and so on. Right. And we've got, for example, members of Butterfly Conservation, and the person who does that comes every week from the beginning of April right through to the end of September and he spends about an hour and a half here right. and he counts every butterfly he sees right. and over the years he has seen now 30 different species of butterfly which is almost half right. the English native um, butterflies and he's seen the numbers increase fantastically so in total they've more than doubled but if you leave out the white ones that have declined the coloured butterflies have increased four times wow, that's amazing. so yeah What's your favourite part of the woodland here? Well, it has to be the arboretum, <laughs> because <laughs> I that's your, because that's your baby. <laughs> that's my that's my baby. Yes, that's right. And but also, it's it's a place where you can see all sixty native trees and shrubs, and they're coming into their fourth year, okay. and many of them are going to flower this year for the first time. So it just gets more and more interesting as time goes by. Right, and you you've been one of the driving forces behind that. I have indeed, and. Uh, Part of the excitement has been trying to track down some of the rarer trees. So, for example, the, the latest we've got is the Plymouth pear. Right. Most people have never heard of it, right. and we couldn't find a supplier, so we approached Kew, and they got seeds from the Millennium Seed Bank and grew them for us, and we planted them out this year. So we have, well, we've probably more than doubled the national population <laughs> of Plymouth pears. How many did you plant? We planted 20. 20, <laughs> and that doubled the national, the national <laughs> stock of that tree. There right. were probably only four or five in the right. wild down in Devon and Cornwall. Fantastic. Yeah, go on. Very nice. <clears throat> I've got to look where I'm going because I just almost walked into a tree. Um, uh, so, so, the ancient woodland. Well, you can see you can see it right on the left there. It's really yes. beautiful. Yes. So that's where we're heading. Yes, and the ancient woodland has been there. We know for more than 400 years, and it was regularly coppiced. It's mostly hornbeam, and it was coppiced, and it would have been logged and cut into small billets, and they would be sent into London to uh, fire the uh, ovens of London. Right. Gosh. So I often say to visitors that maybe the fire of London was started <laughs> by a bit of wood from Langley Wood. Yes. <laughs> but maybe not. Oh. Look, we've got some beautiful white blossoms here, aren't this they? Is blackthorn. That's blackthorn. Blackthorn is the first of the trees to come into blossom. A, a bush that's favoured by nesting birds because it, it develops a really dense thicket. Wow. So it's really good for the environment and all that. Absolutely, stuff. yes. Um, and we saw, we just saw our first butterfly. Yes. Really colourful butterfly. Now this is a wild cherry here. This is one of the very early ones. And what about the birds? I mean, we've not seen any yet. But uh, uh, I hear that there's quite a return of birds here to this landscape. Some of the species have increased quite spectacularly. So white throats that love dense hedges and thickets, um, they have increased in number by almost threefold. We've got a lot of skylarks here. We got an award for one of the few places where the numbers of linnets has been increasing. And uh, they're a very pretty little bird with a red on the head and so on. And I, I read that the return of short-eared owls, is that right? We had them three years in a row, but that was three years ago. Um, they are a very large owl, about a metre wingspan, and they come here in the winter from Scandinavia and some from northern Scotland, but they only come when there's, if you like, an excess of birds in Scandinavia. So we hope they'll come again, but... They're welcome to. They are indeed. OK. So not, they're, not, they're not welcome by the voles and the mice. No. <laughs> they are by the bird watchers. Yes. So we're through the style... Lots of dog walkers. Indeed there are, yes. And, well, immediately you can feel the difference, can't you? Yes. I mean, we're right under the canopy. It's rather wonderful place. So, in fact, throughout most of the forest, you just wander. Yes. But in this bit, there, there are ropes which keep you on the path. Why, why is that here? Well, we've had to do that because we get thousands of visitors in the bluebell season. And they like to walk everywhere. And if you trample an area, it kills the bluebells. Yes. What, what's peak bluebell time then? 
it's different every year depending on the weather yeah. but i suppose late april and early may right for this and yeah. it does feel i mean i know this is a wild place but it feels very structured it's very neat and you said it's like a cathedral <laughs> and there's this central arch it's al almost leading down towards <laughs> the nave of the cathedral Yes, it looks structured because, of course, it was a managed wood. As most of our forests have been, they were managed for a purpose. This was managed in order to grow wood for fuel. Yeah. And you can see the um, hornbeam, particularly one there, looks being cut right back many times. And so it's got about eight or nine stems coming up. Yeah. It, it feels brilliant. I mean, it looks brilliant. It, it's really, really beautiful. But not only are there the bluebells here, it's leading down to a place where we can build some dens. Is oh, that it right? is, yes. Right, not so much maybe you and me, although I'm <laughs> willing to give it a go, but your grandchildren are with us. Well, we found early on that children love building dens with broken branches and whatever, but they were doing it all over the wood and, of course, trampling bluebells when they did it. So what we've done is to uh, earmark one corner and say, make your dens here. Right. And uh, you will see, probably there'll probably be children there when we get there. Okay. Well, let's go, let's go den building. All right, so you're going to climb in the tree? Go on. It's not very high. Uh, thank you for letting me into your wood. What's your name? John T. John T. And what's your name? Barney. John T. And Barney. So, how often have you been here, John T? Uh, um, about three times a year. And what do you, Barney? What do you like doing here? I like collecting oak galls to make ink, or. Um, like doing nature detectives and looking for different um, types of plants and trees. So you've been doing some nature detective work today, is that right? You've got a, a, a little Woodland Trust pamphlet there. Explain to me what that's all about. Well, we went round looking for different types of plants and we went into the same forest just up at the other end and we found some blackthorn, lesser cylindine and bluebells. And on, and then when we were walking around um, on the way out of the forest, we found some wooden enemy too. Gosh, well, that's brilliant. And you seem to know what you're talking about as well. That's very good. Now, am I, a little birdie told me you've got some sort of natural inks. Which one of you have got that? So if you've got, ah, explain to me what all that is. Um, this is an oak gall from an oak tree. Um, but it's created by a wasp going inside the tree and laying eggs and the tree wants to defend itself so it creates the oak galls and then when um, the wasps are grubs they start eating all of the food inside it and then when they're big enough they um, start g coming out and leaving behind the stuff that makes the ink. But then to make the ink, you have to mix it with boiled water and some and some rusted nails. Wow, that's brilliant. Um, you both of you are so incredibly well informed about this woodland. Now, we're in a special area of the woodland here, which is just to the side of the Bluebell Wood. Tell me what's so special about this part of the wood. They have cordoned this area off and cut some trees down to make so there are lots of sticks around to make dens. Wow, have you made a den here? Uh, we made one last year, but we haven't made one since. Do you think we should make one now? Yeah. Okay, well, you lead on and start. Pick a, pick a place, and Becky and I, and Grandpa and Grandma might join you. Yeah. Off you go. You see, I thought Becky might just be managing the project, but no, <laughs> straight in there, picking up a huge tree trunk. Oh, okay, Grandpa's now working out access and exit strategies. We need doors swinging. I have a feeling this might be slightly better built than my home. Um, you, you, would I fit in there? Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> You're very diplomatic as well, uh, which is what I like. Um, do you think you could stay in, in this den overnight, or would it be a bit too cold? Maybe a bit too cold. We could have some leaves to make it waterproof. Yeah, some leaves to make it waterproof. That's very true. There's not enough, there's not enough food. There's not enough food for just for one night? No. No? <laughs> I'm hungry. Okay, but there is a, a tea room quite close by. So 
if we did, I could probably nip around the corner and bring us up something. I w don't think that's going to be the problem. Anyway, it's looking very good. Looking very good. Can you, can you manage that? Oops, okay. Very good. Let's see if I can get in. I, I think I'm going to get in. I may not get out, but send my love to my family and tell them where I'm now living. <laughs> there we are. Ugh. There we are. I'm in. Whoops! Hit my head. But I'm in. Are you blocking me in? Um, okay. Well, it, it seemed a good idea when I was outside. Um, okay. Very good. I got in. I think this passes. This gets the National Building Award. Uh, I just got to get out. I can't, my headphones have slipped over my eyes. I can't see anything. Hold on a sec. <laughs> so we found ourselves a log to sit on. Uh, yeah. Now. You were one of the big driving forces behind the Arboretum. Just tell me a, a bit about that. Well, we realised that many of the visitors who come here couldn't tell an oak tree from an ash tree. And our original idea was perhaps we should just label a few. Um, but like all these ideas, it grew. There aren't that many native trees and shrubs. There's about 60. And is this the only Arboretum in the UK with all of the native species in it? Pro it probably is. It's certainly the only one that has got only native species in it. Most arboretums were started in the 19th century, people bringing back exotic things from abroad, whereas this one was a, literally a, a clean field, blank canvas. I, I have to say, I specialise in ignorant questions, and so here's one. So what is the difference between an arboretum and just a woodland? Well, an arboretum is like a zoo for trees, and so you uh, make sure that they are labelled and you put information about them, and it's really there as an educational thing for people to come and learn about the trees. In Some of the species, though, were quite hard to get hold of, and in fact, uh, we bought Scots pine, and were then told that they were English Scots pine, not the original Caledonian pines that we should have had, and uh, at the end of a few inquiries, we managed to get some from the Balmoral Estate, um, seeds from the Balmoral Estate, I should say. Yes, I, I knew you weren't going in <laughs> and stealing the Queen's trees. So, yeah, you got some seeds. Yeah. What sort of difference has it made to your life, and you're here with your wife and your grandchildren here, what sort of difference has it made to you having this on your doorstep? Well, the first thing to say is it's the only wild area within probably about 15 or 20 miles of, of Harpenden and Wheatonshire where we live. So it's lovely to have that. But the other thing is that coming regularly to work parties... Um, I've made a whole load of new friends and like many people I, I worked away from where I lived and didn't know very many people locally whereas now we have a work party we go to the pub afterwards and uh, you know, I can count probably 20 or 30 people now that are close friends and I know there is an argument which says we should build nature for nature's sake and keep people off it because you know they can trample on the bluebells and destroy it that's certainly not the Woodland Trust's view it, it encourages people to come do you think that's the right approach? It's a difficult balance to get right, to be honest. Um, clearly, we do want the wild areas, the woodlands, uh, the wildflower meadows to be there for the birds and for the butterflies and so on, and for wildlife. But at the same time, we want people to enjoy it. And so what we're trying to do is, is make sure that people go to the right places. Um, we try and ask them to keep dogs on, under control in some areas. And by and large, that's succeeding. But I think there's more to be done. Okay, so I've come out of the Bluebell Woods, uh, which is it's really covered, so it's, it does feel cathedral-like, and it's it's uh, qu quite dark, I suppose, in there, into a very open field where the sun is shining, and and I'm meeting Tim and his two dogs, and I can see the two dogs, and I can see Tim. Hello, Tim. <laughs> nice to see Hello you. There, yes. So, what are, you, what are your dogs' names first well, of all? The brown one's called uh, Archie, and this old one here, who's deaf, unfortunately, is called Molly. Right. And, and Archie's gone to play with Becky. Be yeah. Becky's, uh, if you hear noises off, it's either Archie or Becky. I'm trusting you'll know which is which. Archie will have taken uh, Becky a stone for Becky to throw, right. which he would, uh, that will be a, a persistent thing okay. virtually yeah. the whole of the time. Yes, I could, I, and that's happening right now. Now, you asked us to meet you in this part of the wood because it's, although it's a very open area, lots of open fields, it's important why. Well, it marks the first, the very first trees that were planted over 10 years ago now, and also the last right. trees that were planted just just a year ago. So how did you get involved? 
I took early retirement and was looking for something that was completely different to my previous employment. What did, what you, did you do? Outdoors? I was a telecoms engineer, so um, very different. Uh, so coming out here, learning about trees, the countryside, and getting involved in a most amazing program uh, just seemed ideal. And as time went on, um, getting involved in, in the work parties and starting to take some leadership roles was fantastic. And did you know anything about trees beforehand or did you just come with a willing pair of hands? A willing pair of hands. My dad knew about trees. He would often point out to me, I can remember as a child, that's a such and such, that's a birch, that's a hash or whatever. But no, it, it never really filtered down to me. But now I just love them. So you've brought me to this part of the wood because it's where the first and the last mm -hmm. trees were planted. What's your favourite part of the woodland? If we're talking to people who might visit, what would your advice be of a, a nice little corner to go to? Well, a quiet corner is what we call high trees. Um, it was the most recently planted area, and it's in fact the remotest area of hardwood. So you can, you can walk around there, it'll take you about 45 minutes, a circular walk. Uh, and you, if you meet somebody, you'll be, that will be a surprise. Yeah. But it's beautiful. It has lovely views back over the village here. So high trees if you want something nice and quiet. Yeah. Uh, are there any other magical parts of the, yeah. the forest here, well, the woodland? The, the one that makes me uh, smile a bit is, is something we were involved in just uh, uh, last month. And that was planting a willow tunnel in what's called the magical wood. And in the middle of it is a huge, the biggest picnic tail you ever did see. Becky, you up for going to the, a big picnic table? Yes. You've been throwing stones <laughs> for the uh, dog. Being Archie, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Very oh, good. Yeah. So that's up this hill. So, Becky, yeah. you must go to woodlands all over the country. I do. What sort of make, marks this out as particularly different or important? Okay, so it's big. So it's uh, 858 acres, the site, so it, that's big. It's the biggest new sort of continuous native woodland in England, actually. Um, and I think it, it gets a lot of things right here. So there's some fantastic ancient woodland. And there's um, also obviously a lot of new trees have gone in here, a lot of new woodlands being created. But the thing I love about it, and I think it's kind of what people respond to. You're, today you'll see lots of people out here. It's the mix of different habitats here. So it's the mix of the ancient woodland and the new woodland and the open spaces and the wild flower meadows. And that's great for wildlife, that mix. But it's also great for people. You know, I always see lots and lots of happy people here and people just love it and really respond to the site, even though it's still very new. I mean, we're here now and the trees are probably just up to above our heads. Well, quite a long way above your head. <laughs> Blimey, <laughs> yes, <laughs> accurate but harsh. Yes, it's a long way above my head. But, you know, this is still a very newly planted area, really, and there are some even newer areas. And it, but it's 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 changing all the time. And I think the fact that the volunteers have been involved from the beginning and have done so much of that monitoring and shape, help shape it and help create it, that makes it very special as well. How common is that amongst the other Woodland Trust woods, the, that involvement of volunteers? So we, we always, I would say, involve volunteers, um, in, particularly in our bigger sites and particularly where we've got new woods going in. So that's not that unusual. But I think it is the way in which um, over the past 10 years there has been this kind of group of volunteers that has stayed throughout and has taken on different roles as the wood has evolved if you like so that's been quite unique I think and I would I would actually love to replicate that in more of our places and I think because for me it symbolizes what I think is so important in the sort of you know in the in the nature movement at the moment which is that it's going to take an awful lot of people to get to where we need to get in terms of our natural world and in terms of facing into things like climate change and you know we want more and more people doing their bit and I think this place is very symbolic of that that people come for all sorts of motivations and get stuck in and do their bit and I think that's incredibly important sorry do sound we have barely started I'm a bit out of breath um <laughs> Yeah, how far up? We've a little way to go yet. We've, we've a little we've, way to yeah, go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Have we lost one of the dogs? <laughs> Sorry? We appear to have lost one of the dogs, yes. Okay. I, uh, well, we'll uh, but she'll be. Uh, <laughs> but well, let's there's no point in me calling her because I. <laughs> she because she can't hear very well. <laughs> okay. And if and. Uh, Do you want me to go back and try and find her? I'll just I'll just step back for, for a moment. Uh, okay. <laughs> All right. So having momentarily lost our dog, <laughs> the dogs are back. They are dogs are back. She, she rather likes these benches that you will find in Harwood Forest here, here and there. Where people will sit and have a picnic or something. In so fact, we're coming up across a indeed. family doing that right now, and the, the dog's are already interested. I think Absolutely. we might lose the dogs Slightest again. Slightest crumb, the merest hint of a crisp, you know, that's it, that's enough. <laughs> so we're skirting the edge of the bluebell forest here, and on the edge you can see quite a lot of. Is it cherry blossom? The cherry blossom. Yes, at this time of the year, um, it's wonderful to see uh, the cherry trees, the cherry blossom. Um, and indeed, we, it's it's uh, many old woods. You'll find cherry trees around the perimeter, and we tried to replicate that a little bit with some of the new planting here. And were you here when it was just farmland? Uh, I joined. I started the planting about a month or so after the very first trees were planted. So I came in on a very wet January morning. In what must have been. Uh, 2010 I suppose it would have been yeah um, didn't know where on earth I was it just looked like a ploughed field to me right. and there was these people shoving sticks of sort of handfuls of saplings in my hand plant them there <laughs> uh, what on earth am I doing here is this a good idea <laughs> and uh, but there we are you know now um, it's it's hard to imagine just how it was to be quite honest well, it showed your mettle, showed commitment. Well, you, you didn't start in the summer or anything. It's a, oh, no, a cold no. January just after Christmas <laughs> in a muddy field. Absolutely. And it was, a, it was a particularly wet winter, I think, that day. And the field was heavy. Uh, this is the magical wood. Very good. And on that little sign to the magical wood, it says woodland yoga. Have you ever done woodland yoga? Uh, no, I've been invited to to, to do woodland yoga, but I, I've, I've yet to done it. I've yet to pluck up the courage. Yes, um, it's it's. Um, I've been assured that for old men like me, it's it's where you're getting a bit stiff. You know, the joints don't bend quite like they used to. Yoga is what what's what, well, yoga is a good thing. Yes. But uh, well, look, it's the start of spring. It's the time <laughs> to get involved in woodland yoga. You ever done that, Becky? Uh, she's looking at the poster, um, <laughs> which is probably as far as that will go. Uh, it, so where is this taking us? This is taking us to the centre of the magical wood, where we'll find an a, a, a enormous uh, picnic bench, which could probably seat about 30 people if you wanted. And I hear you've brought me a fantastic picnic with champagne and stuff. Do you heard that, did you? Yes. Uh, <laughs> was, that not, was I misinformed? I may have been misinformed. Okay, so this, this magical wood was planted um, entirely by f family, friends and staff of the Disney stores in the UK. Um, they did it over three years. Um, a huge effort, but it was a wonderful to see. And as you can see, just looking around you, how fantastic it's become. I can see brightly coloured jackets ahead i think there are loads of kids is this the, are we coming up to the big picnic table we are indeed this is uh, this is it yes okay Some, someone's got there before us I, th I thought this was my own personal woodland trail okay there we are after having not seen anybody we're surrounded by about 10 15 kids playing football jumping on the i don't know what they're playing but, but they're running around so just tell me a bit about this area and what's special about it. So we're right in the centre now of Magical Wood where there's this uh, uh, picnic table. Um, and uh, just recently we, in fact last month, we put in a, um, a willow tunnel. Um, so it's, a, it's intended to be a living uh, tunnel. The, the, the willows we hope will, will survive um, and it will green up. And, uh, but it's something clearly the, 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 the kids love. They'll run in and out of that. Very good. So how often do you come down here now? All the, all the main work is done. Well, it's true, it is. Um, and <laughs> that's quite a, uh, a poignant sort of question. Um, but a bittersweet moment for you then, seeing yeah. the completion of the woodland. Yes, it is. And um, there are little bits and pieces to tidy up. There's, there's um, a little bit of planting of some hedgerows around the perimeter. 
But it must also be lovely to have been such a fundamental part, not just of growing the woodland for nature and for the birds and and the the animals that have enjoyed this area, but to see right where we're sitting here, the local community yeah. enjoying it, it being an important part of these children's lives. And they'll yeah. must remember this when, yeah. when they get to your you're my age. That's right. That's right. I, I certainly hope so. And uh, occasionally, if we engage with any of the children, we'll ask them. Did, did you come along with to do any planting? Some of them did, either with their own families on the public days. Some of them came with their schools. There were many schools planting days. And that's the story they can tell to their children and did their grandchildren. Yeah. Your grandfather yeah, helped it's, build it's, this it's, wood. It's that public engagement uh, that really, I think, is, is, is quite fundamental to the, if you like, the, the ethos of Heartwood. Um, it's, it's what's keeping it special it makes people want to look after it it's why we've you know, you know people care about it if is this the best woodland you've ever ever seen oh of course of course <laughs> <laughs> what am i what am i supposed to say <laughs> i was just giving you the opportunity right well becky and i are going to head off uh further into the woodland where would you suggest we, we go I suggest we go into, you can probably see on the, uh, uh, over the side there, another ancient piece of ancient woodland. I suggest we walk into there, then we can uh, take a, a route back towards the car park. Okay. So we've turned off the main path. Yes. Have you any idea where we are? <laughs> I think we're in Wellwood, right. which runs into Puddler's Wood. There's more of the ancient woodland on the site, so we've got, you know, big mature trees, bluebells again, which is fantastic. So this doesn't look like this was planted by the Woodland Trust. Do you think this no. was already here? No, there were four areas of existing ancient woodland when we acquired the site, and this is one of them. Yeah. Okay. yeah. And we're just we're just heading into the woods. We are. Okay. You are going to get me home, aren't <laughs> you, Becky? I, I have faith in you. I have faith in you. I mean, you've been. how long have you been with the Woodland Trust now? Oh, nearly five years, which yeah. seems amazing. It's flown by. Gone, yeah. Gone fast. Yeah. But have you always been interested in woods and nature? Have you a bit of a walker? Oh, yeah. No, I, I mean, I had... Um, well, I had what I thought was a very standard childhood, but when I talked to people, I realised it probably wasn't. Right. Yeah, so I grew up in, in Dorset um, and, uh, you know, in a little village. And, yeah, we basically pretty much ran wild. You right. know, we went out all day and... You know, kind of, you know, if we, we come back for supper sort of thing, you know. Um, and, and, and all of that. And camping was what we did when we went on holiday. And that was always in the UK. <laughs> so, you know, that, that sort of thing I grew up with. And um, and so, and I, I you know, my mother was a great... Um, she loved her wildflowers and her trees. So I kind of learned something, I think, from her. So, yeah, I guess I have always been pointing in this direction, but probably didn't realise it for a while when I was a younger adult. Yeah. You still go camping now, don't you? I've seen yeah. pictures of you in sort of sou'westers. <laughs> Looks like you're going on some expedition. They go, no, that's Becky's holiday. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm a big camping fan. There is nothing better than kind of waking up somewhere beautiful, being woken up by the dawn, by birdsong, because it, of course it all, you know, comes into your tent, and uh, and just sort of, you know, sticking your head out and realising there's an amazing day waiting for you. It is, I find it hugely, hugely enjoyable and very relaxing as well. And were you around when plans for Hartwood were first discussed? No, I can't take any of the credit for this amazing place. I think I got to ply, help plant the last tree. Well, that's very good. So everyone else did the work and you came in to open it. No, it was um, you know, so it was a ten-year project. So it was started really in two thousand and eight when the site was acquired, uh, which was way before my time. Um, but I mean, I think it was really, um, it was very, it would have felt, I think, very ambitious for the Woodland Trust at the time. Um, very, very different to be trying to create a new native woodland on this scale. Um, but it's just been a marvellous project. It really has, and people, I think have taken it to their hearts you know people are, who live around here have really joined in it's felt a really combined effort yes. and if if this project was already underway when you joined what's the most exciting thing that you're involved with at the moment that might come to fruition in the next few years that you can tell us about <laughs> well now where do i begin there's lots actually uh so we've just we've just acquired a mountain in Scotland, right, Ben nice. Shieldig, yeah, which is up in Torridon, um, and that's got fantastic remnants of Caledonian 
pine and it's got some lovely kind of birch and oak uh, woodland as well that's in that kind of temperate rainforest type zone on the west coast so um I think that's going to be really exciting to try and kind of um probably through a combination of natural regeneration and planting to protect what's there and um again increase its resilience um so that's going to be great and i'm going up to see that in may so next month um and then we're also involved in a very big project called the northern forest which is working with some of the community forests in the north of england to create really a, a mosaic of different kinds of woodland and forest and trees across from kind of Liverpool to Hull really um, and that's just that's very ambitious it's a 25 year project so actually I probably won't be around when that one <laughs> finishes but uh, it's, it's, it's kind of happening on the kind of scale I think we need to think on in terms of what we've got to do for nature and for climate change really so it's happening on a big scale it involves lots of people hopefully even more as we go into it um which sorry which we've come to a choice <laughs> which path would you like to take I'm go that way. okay <laughs> right, carry on um so that's going to be um that's going to be really exciting i think and, i mean there's now a lot of talk about the environment uh, people worried about it people i think perhaps engaging with it more Presumably that's helpful to getting support for the creation of woodland? Yes, uh, it, I feel as though trees and woods in particular have gone up the agenda because, you know, I always say if, if trees didn't exist, we'd be trying to invent them right now because they can do so much of what we need. So they, they're great for nature. They're fantastic in terms of providing an environment like this where you can kind of come and you know get sort of physically refreshed and mentally refreshed but they're also you know cleaning the air we breathe they're helping prevent flooding uh, and they're, they're sequestering carbon as they grow as well and you know all of these issues are very real issues for us I think today and um, you know so if we didn't have them we would be trying to invent them but they actually do it very well so I think they're going up the agenda and that's good news from our perspective I think um, <laughs> there's kind of, I think there's a, a growing awareness. I think we were talking about this um, the other day, this sort of, you, lots of people empathise, I think, around nature being in trouble and want to do the right thing, but it's tipping that over into taking action, I think, and then persuading, you know, those who have huge influence like politicians to make the right framework decisions in a way that will enable us to will reverse the decline of nature but also tackle tackle climate change and for me those two things are completely interlocked you know i worry sometimes that we're going to try and tackle climate change through all kinds of um quite intensive semi-industrial methods which are some of the methods that have got us into trouble in the first place so you know i think by um, allowing nature to thrive we also tackle some of our climate change issues so i think a lot of people, no doubt, are involved with the Woodland Trust, mm. like taking walks like the one we're taking yeah. today, but don't feel very political about it. They yeah. just, they like it, they enjoy yeah. it. There's nothing wrong with that, is there? No, there's nothing wrong with that at all. I mean, I, I think, our, our, I always say our supporter base is a really broad church. You know, there are people who just like the idea of woods being protected. There are people who love to come and enjoy them and walk in them. And then there are people who are concerned about climate change, you know. So that, that whole kind of um, broad church is really important, I think. And trees are a great unifier in that sense. But I do think, <laughs> increasingly, you know, we, we, it, it, it behoves us all, really, to kind of understand the context in which we're living today um, and, and to understand that, you know, although this is here now and it's a fantastic place to be and it's kind of coping with climate change now, you know, we were talking about trees coming out and leafing at slightly odd times, you know, and we do a whole lot of work called Nature's Calendar that monitors that and we can see the change over the last 20 years this won't be here for our children and our children's children to enjoy unless we tackle it so you know we have to kind of um I suppose not stick our heads in the sand and pretend it's not happening we have to think about how we live and how that affects particularly future generations I think and I suppose I mean do you think this is true that if you just take a, a walk in the woods but if you join things like the Woodland Trust or just know that you're out there and politicians see that happening they know that that's important to the people and therefore they'll act differently. So 
you may not be very politically involved, but just showing that you care makes a difference. Is that fair? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I, I think increasingly politicians listen to people power. They listen, If they sense there's a movement around something, they really sit up and take notice. And I, um, I think one of the ways in which you can build that sense of a movement is through membership of, of some of the environmental charities, not just us, but, you know, the RSPB, the Wildlife Trust, the National Trust, lots of smaller charities that are particularly interested in particular species. And, and that just creates a sense of a kind of wave of people who really care about this stuff and want the right decisions to be made. And, and it, it's much more powerful for us to be able to go and talk to a politician about, for example, um, well, the latest thing we achieved was the change in protection for ancient woodland, for example, in the planning uh, policy framework. And to be able to go and say, we have got 250,000 members, you know, who care enough about the work we do to put some skin in the game and to put some money on the table and want to support it that's an incredibly powerful message to take so it it does matter you know i think it, it, it it's in a way i i mean you know, i anyone who cares about this stuff and is doing their bit that's fantastic but i think if you want to make a change and make a difference then you have to put some skin in the game really it doesn't have to be with us it doesn't even have to be with an environmental charity if there's another way you can volunteer or or give some voice to a campaign but really kind of do something yourself because that's so important okay. let's crack on <coughs> There's a big tree across the path. You might have to help me over it. <laughs> uh, um, I have to say, this is the best time of year for me. The, sp yeah. the spring. Isn't you, it great? It, you c it, it does smell sweet. You yeah. could wake up and the air smells different. I much prefer it to summer. So some oh. of that is about, I think, it's the minerals in the earth. There's a year they've done, they've kind of investigated right. all this. And actually, so you're smelling the earth coming to life, right. literally. Um, and uh, it is a fantastic time of year. I would just heard my first chiff chaff earlier on, which yeah. I was really excited about because they're a real harbinger of spring, you know, yeah. and I haven't heard one yet this year. Yeah. Just to stand here and hear the bird song and, yeah. and hear the kind of movement of a gentle wind amongst new fresh leaves. Well, that was a woodpecker. You know, it's, it's just great. Yeah. And it is amazing that when we started, it felt very crowded. And since we turned right, Becky, I've not seen anybody. <laughs> <laughs> I don't mean to sound overly worried about this. <laughs> But anyway, it's just very nice. You're doing your panicking urbanite. Yeah, I am. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm a city boy at heart. And um, unless there's a tube station nearby, I go, well, I don't know how to get home. Did we not explain to you that it was all about building the den and sleeping <laughs> Yes, out? yeah. Well, the kids were very keen I, to leave me in the den, I think. And it is amazing. I mean, it's amazing for me because although, I mean, I live in, in London and there are lots of parks, mm. it is an amazing treat to come out today. Yeah. It just does feel so different. And so many of us now live in cities that you somehow di disconnected from nature because you just feel, well, nature's something other. Yeah. I, 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 and I think what's been interesting for us is um, all the people who are standing up for their street trees now. And I think that's about you live in a city. Perhaps the bit of nature that you see most often <laughs> is a street tree, you know, either on your walk to work or outside your door if you're lucky, and the kind of the wildlife that kind of exists in that sort of um, in that sort of environment. And um, so I think people are really waking up to that, and they're realising that those street trees cool their city when it gets really hot now in the summer, kind of help perhaps intercept sudden bursts of rainfall to stop surface flooding, and, and they're just kind of appreciating them much more. I mean, a lot of people are pessimistic about the natural world, given what the Woodland Trust achieves, but indeed lots of other environmental charities and how quickly things like Hartwood can develop. How optimistic or pessimistic are you about the environmental future? Mm -hmm. um, so, time is not on our side and we are not on the right trajectory yet, but <laughs> uh, when I come somewhere like this, or I visit NEP, or, you know, some of the fantastic... Um, ancient boreal forests that still are around the world you know I have hope we've got to restore you know where they have been damaged in the past and we've got to create new forests and woods as well and you know I think that is all possible but we have to make the right decisions and we have to make them now. That's a nice optimistic I suppose <laughs> uh, place to, to end so we we've been wandering around this woodland talking to some of the volunteers who've made it possible, talking to you, which is great. What's your hope for this podcast and how people can get involved or what you want it to be? Well, I think, 
I mean, I love podcasts actually because I think they kind of get into your head a bit. It's you know, it's like listening to somebody who really is right there, and I, I really hope that people will find it interesting and find it a way of finding out a bit more about the kind of work we do, but we'll also see it as a kind of a spur to action, really, to do their own thing, to contribute, whatever that may be, to maybe send in recordings of their own kind of woodland walks and add to this one, and just keep building that sense of a movement, because you know, that is what the natural world needs, I think, and, uh, and we need to crack on with it, and it'll take all of us, I think. Well, thank you very much, Becky, and thank you very much to you for listening. We do want this to be a very inclusive podcast, so if you've taken a walk that's special to you and want to make a a little five-minute audio recording just on your phone or whatever and send that in, we'll try and include it in a future podcast. And if you just can't do that but want to send me a short note by email about your favourite walk and why it makes it special, that would also be great. We'll give you the contact details in a moment. We're off to another woodland walk very soon and we hope you'll join us for that as well until next time thanks very much take care and goodbye thank you for listening to the woodland trust podcast woodland walks with adam shaw join us next month when adam will be taking another woodland walk in the company of woodland trust staff and volunteers Don't forget to subscribe to this series on iTunes or wherever you're listening to this podcast. And do give us a rating and a review. And why not send in your own recording of your favourite woodland walk to be included in a future podcast? Do keep it to a maximum of five minutes and please tell us what makes your woodland walk special. Alternatively, just send us an email with your thoughts about favourite walks you've been on and what makes them special for you. You can send your email thoughts and any audio files to podcast at woodlandtrust.org.uk. We look forward to hearing from you.